Good evening. It's 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 a it's a great pleasure to be here um, and and to watch that film again. That's actually the fifth time that I've seen it, um, and but uh, this was the only time I watched it uh, uh, with a group, um, um, and it was uh, very nice to see uh, and and feel in the room the the reaction to it. So that that pleased me very much. Um, um, I have, uh, in addition to many others, to thank. Um, uh, in particular, for, for my being a trustee right now, I have my grandfather to thank for founding the, the institution, my father to thank. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, as speaking with uh, Tom in, in Texas a couple weeks ago, I have uh, the great Ambassador Richard Holbrook to thank in, in, in particular. Um, and uh, he actually, uh, it was at the 2000, uh, maybe just the 2000 uh, Democratic Convention, he came up to me and pointed and said, Charles, your father never comes to meetings. I need you on the board. <laughs> and, and, and he's kind of a big guy. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was the same height, but he's just kind of bigger. And I could feel like it beat me up. You know, that, um, but I was very, so that's, that was the actual moment. Uh, when, when it, and soon after, I became a, a trustee um, with, with his letter of recommendation. So that worked out well. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I did not know my grandfather well. I, I only have the faintest uh, memories of him. I was only five when he passed away. Um, but I feel that I have learned a lot from him and, f and know a, f a fair amount about him um, and the qualities that dro drove him to create this great institution. Um, even without knowing him personally, I, I have a strong spiritual relationship with him. Um, and it began. Uh, you know, not only in my childhood, but soon after I uh, moved uh, to New York after college, um, having grown up mostly in, in, in Washington, D.C., um, and, and through, I, I made a point of becoming very close to my great uncles, uh, David and, uh, and Lawrence, um, and sort of like to think of them as my surrogate grandfathers. Um, and um, and I, I got to, you know, know many stories about my grandfather through, through them. Um, and, uh, and then I heard his voice, actually, uh, for the first time when I was listening to a recording of the opening of Lincoln Center when he was, uh, and, and there was sort of two at, at, at their house in, uh, in, in, uh, near uh, Picantico Hills. Um, there's sort of a, you know, a record player there and the records of, the, of that evening. I said to list, listen to it. It was, it was wonderful. Um, and so actually, uh, the next phase of my uh, uh, speaking of his voice, um, I have actually, there are three quotations in particular of, of his that I'd like to, they're just short ones, um, but that I thought uh, uh, that, that I would enjoy uh, telling you, um, uh, because it actually kind of sets the stage for, the, for what a lot of you know already, but what, for what and what will be discussed later at the panel. Um, so the first one is, those of us who had a hand in, in establishing the Asia Society shared a basic intent to contribute to broader and deeper understanding between the peoples of the United States and Asia. And of course, that's part of the mission statement. Um, I, I found that one to be, uh, I, I liked it because he was known to be a very modest man. And, and uh, you know, those of us who had a hand in, in creating this institution, I think you know, his, his hand was, he knew his hand was the, the biggest, um, but he just, again, always, uh, you know, it was the group mentality. He also said, we founders of Asia Society were confident that Asians and Americans are capable of a richer and more meaningful mutual understanding because of shared hopes, fears, and aspirations. And it was that sharing that he felt very strongly. And the last one is, there is a bond that should be lead us to a mutual understanding and respect based not on mere tolerance of our differences, but on our awareness that the world is richer for those differences. And we as individuals are thereby richer in our humanity. Um, Several of my grandfather's characteristics uh, to consider and how his, in his vision, how Bob Oxnam put it, that bold moment uh, that produced this great institution in its 60 years of work. Um, the first characteristic uh, was curiosity. He had from an early age an intense curiosity about Asia. And his father, uh, uh, John D. Jr., set the stage for that um, by uh, taking the, tra the family there many times uh, 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 on, on, on trips, um, and uh, and then Junior actually even established the Peking Union Medical College, um, uh, which which was the largest hospital in China at the time. Um, he also made a gift to restore the Imperial Museum Library after an earthquake in in, in Japan, um, and uh, and they they collected some 
uh, Asian art, but then my grandfather and, and, and my grandmother, Blanchette, uh, sort of did a lot more of it. Um, but they actually, uh, they had a room in their vacation house in Maine, um, which was known as the Buddha room, and it was just full of, 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 of Buddhas. Um, and then the, the work that it took just to get those to Maine and then to the, build the house and then have it at the top of the hill, just like the, the effort that that took, really showed an appreciation, I think. Um, so there was my grandfather at a very young age, spending time in China, Japan, and other Asian countries, a lot of time. And even when he wasn't actually in those countries, he was still feeling them through his parents' art collection um, while he was in the United States. Um, and he, of course, as, 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 as we all know, experienced this when so few Americans had the opportunity, uh, uh, well, the inclination, but much less so the opportunity to visit those countries. And I've always thought that his uh, inspiration came indirectly from his parents, but also, also from uh, within himself. The other characteristic, um, his generosity. Um, my, he was uh, deeply interested in using his, ma his resources to make a positive impact here and around the country and the world. Um, he, it, it's, it's not a very well-known fact, but he was also uh, the primary founder of Lincoln Center. Um, and he wasn't even a huge fan of some kinds of performing arts, uh, but he just thought that New York needed to have it, and that it's just so generous in its, in, in, in its nature. Um, so af after World War II, uh, he and my grandmother traveled, uh, her name was Blanchette, traveled nearly every year to Asia. They took long trips, never just parachuting in, always delving well beneath the surface, meeting leaders in the countries, soaking up the arts and culture and societies. And uh, interestingly also, he was on the delegation that John Foster Dulles brought to Japan to help lay out the plans for the post-war uh, rebuilding. Um, Another little, I enjoy little known facts, as, as, as you can tell. Uh, to me, they're not trivia, they're, 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 they're a big deal. Um, but another one is that he paid visits to the Philippines, and when the Philippine leader, um, Ramon Magsese, did I say that correctly? Someone, uh, an expert can tell me that yes, I did okay with that, okay. Um, when he was killed in a plane crash, my father helped, uh, my grandfather helped to support the creation of the award named after him, uh, still considered, after Magsese, the, the, still considered the Nobel for Asia. And so, but back to the trips though, he had some fundamental takeaways from those. And the first was that America, by and large, didn't know much at all about these countries, about Asia, or about Asia in general. Um, and as was said uh, by Mr. Brokaw, it was seen mostly as a place involving war and poverty and devastation. But my grandfather saw something else, he saw potential. He knew and appreciated the history and the heritage, and he believed that one needed to understand the arts and culture of Asia if you were to begin to understand the societies as a whole. Uh, two words often used to describe him are quiet and passion, mostly together. Quiet passion are the words um, associated with him. And in this case, it meant given his vision and passion for starting such a visionary entity, we shouldn't be surprised that he was able to create the Asia Society, sustain it, sustain it so well, and leave it to future generations in such a strong position. Our family has uh, uh, proudly kept a connection to Asia Society, my father, and then me, and, um, uh, and, and actually we're, put, uh, we're putting together an event uh, coming up in a few weeks for other younger members of the family to come here and, uh, and to get to know the institution better. Um, but uh, I, I know for a fact that my grandfather would be so pleased and proud to, uh, to see all of you here tonight um, to, and to see how this organization has blossomed and flourished in the last 60 years and that his mission lives on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, actually, if I can, I'm deviating from the plan a little bit. If I can invite the panel to come up uh, while I uh, uh, say a couple of words of introduction to them. Um, we invited all the uh, living chairs and presidents of this institution to come. In case you're wondering, Hank Greenberg and Vishaka Desai had to send their regrets. Um, and Henrietta Four, our current co-chair with Ronnie, is uh, actually hightailing it in 
and may arrive any moment, but I think she'll miss the panel. But uh, if somebody sees Henrietta, uh, that would be great, and she can at least ask a question. Thumbs up? No. Okay, great. Um, as I said at the outset, uh, if you want to talk about our history, uh, it doesn't get much better than the folks who are uh, taking their places here. It's a stellar group, and they're responsible for so much of the history. I'm going to go in alphabetical order because I wouldn't know where to begin otherwise. Um, Ronnie Chan, you saw in the film. Actually, you saw all these people in the film. Uh, second from the end on the right is co-chair of the board, currently here at the Asia Society, chair of our Hong Kong Center, uh, and chairman of the Hong Lung Group. Uh, serves on any number of governing or advisory bodies um, of think tanks and universities, and you can read more about that in the bios. Uh, but as far as this evening is concerned, I think what's relevant is that uh, uh, Ronnie is really uh, one of the true <coughs> longstanding champions, both of the Global Asia Society and certainly uh, of the Hong Kong Center. I'm going to mention Jack Wadsworth again, but uh, Ronnie and Jack really as much as uh, as anyone in this room at least, and in, in probably anywhere, uh, have everything to do um, and as founding fathers of that amazing place. If you haven't seen it and find yourself anywhere near Hong Kong, I encourage you to visit. Uh, Robert Oxum, on the end, served as president of the Asia Society for more than a decade uh, through the 1980s and early 90s, but uh, he came to the society, and I'm sure he'll talk about it earlier than that, serving as uh, what was then known as the China Council of the Asia Society in the 1970s, and then Vice President and Washington uh, Center Director. And as he said to me yesterday, uh, he is best qualified among this group, perhaps uniquely qualified, uh, to speak about the Asia Society's first decades and his engagement, actually, with Mr. Rockefeller. Bob has also taught at Trinity College, Columbia University, and at Williams, and it's great to have you here. Uh, Ambassador Nicholas Platt, actually when I first met Ambassador Platt, he told me to knock off the ambassador stuff, call me Nick, so, but I'm introducing you now, so you're Ambassador Platt. Uh, he succeeded Bob Oxnum as president, uh, also served for a decade here, truly distinguished career diplomat, as you saw in the film, uh, was on the landmark trip uh, with President Nixon to China. He had actually served already as a China analyst in the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong uh, from 1964 to 1968, and then subsequently served in Beijing and later as ambassador to Zambia, the Philippines, and Pakistan. Uh, Josette Sheeran at center uh, on the stage is the seventh president of the Asia Society, so we've got three of the seven here. She's also my boss. Um, came to us via the World Economic Forum, uh, the World Food Program before that, and various senior posts. Uh, in the U.S. government, uh, joined us um, in 2013. And our moderator, I guess, is the relative newcomer uh, to the organization, um, and about as distinguished as moderators get. Uh, Kevin Rudd, former prime minister and foreign minister of Australia, um, and uh, joined the Asia Society last year as head of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, he's an expert on many things, China and climate issues among them, has authored major reports just in the last year on U.S.-China relations and on a review of the United Nations system. As I said, quite a group. I'll stop talking now. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. The, um, Charles, I really enjoyed your reflections on your grandfather. And uh, I like the words you used about um, a certain quiet passion. Uh, and you can see that in the man's eyes. Um, and it takes uh, both passion and determination to create an institution like this. Also, in our earlier discussion, you uh, said of him that he, he and other members of the family have often chose to walk the more difficult road. Um, and I think... Um, that's probably where I'd like to start this evening as we go back to the history of uh, this, uh, this great institution. Um, because what's always fascinated me as uh, the ranking foreigner in this group, which means there's only one of us, that's me, uh, that's how I get to be ranking, the, um, is cast your mind back <clears throat> to June of 1956 and how it came to be that uh, John D. Rockefeller III not just had the inspiration, but frankly, the political guts uh, to do something about it. Before I turn to uh, Bob for reflections on uh, those uh, 
momentous times. I got my staff to dig out some New York Times uh, front page stories from the 28th of June 1956, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of what was going on at the time. UN Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld has just taken off for what we now call JFK Airport in Queens on a discreet diplomatic visit, obviously it wasn't too discreet, to meet <laughs> with the new crop of Soviet leaders. Stalin had just gone and there was a new bunch in town in Moscow. Uh, Dulles declares attack on Stalin has shaken reds. In this article, Dulles argued that the USSR had not had any diplomatic victory since 1950 and hinted that the ongoing de-Stalinisation campaign may be undermining the Communist Party's grip on power. But my special uh, like uh, for this selection from the news media of the day, June 28, 1956, uh, is uh, this report. The House Committee on Un-American Activities uh, voted to give Arthur Miller, an accomplished playwright and husband of Marilyn Monroe, among other achievements, uh, 10 days to answer questions on his alleged Communist Front activities. Miller accepted to attend the hearing on the condition that he be not asked to name names. The committee agreed, asked why the Communist Party had produced one of his plays. Arthur Miller said, quote, I take no more responsibility for who plays my plays than General Motors can take for who rides in Chevrolets. <clears throat> as he testified, he was, prepared, he was pressured to name names, which he refused and as per their agreement. But as a result, a judge found that Miller was guilty of contempt of Congress in May of 57. He was sentenced to a fine and a prison sentence, which were repealed a year later. Uh, these, as I'd say in the classics, were interesting times here in the United States of America, June of 1956. So, Bob, how did this guy, John D. Rockefeller III, in the midst of all of that, decide to establish this institution? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating story. And uh, I think in part, it's because in the Rockefeller family, there are many members who are sort of enticed by challenges. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, it's that. But I think it's deeper than that, because he, uh, in fact, along with Blanchet, uh, had spent so much time in Asia from 1929 on regular visitors, and by the 1950s, he was becoming a collector of Asian art and was advised by the famous Sherman Lee on, on that collecting, and therefore we now have one of the most fantastic collections here at the Asia Society. So he was hooked on Asia at that period. He was certainly aware of the odds against an Asia Society work. I mean, it was not just a question of House Un-American and Senate Un-American Activities Committee. It was also immediately after the Korean War. It was with the memories of World War II in which so many Americans, when they looked at Asia, said, this is a place which is full of poverty and full of war and nothing much else. And uh, given all of that, I think that JDR III uh, was making a bet, a bet on the future. And the bet was that the art that he knew about and treasured showed the very best of Asia and that that mm. could rise again. And secondly, uh, he was someone who knew people in Asia. We didn't just see them as countries, didn't just see them as a problem, but in fact had hundreds of people around China and Japan and Southeast Asia. So all of that, I think, led him to make a tough decision. And the one final thing about it is I, I had the, pro, the pleasure of meeting JDR III five or six times. When you saw him make a decision, and I saw it a couple of times in a board meeting that I attended, he began to smile just slightly and to indicate that he was determined that it was going to work out this way. And somehow the whole room came behind him at that moment. So, all of JDR III was in that really tough decision. Uh, Nick Platt asks if he can add a point. <laughs> Am I going to say no to that, my friend? <laughs> you could. Um, no, I, you I, 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 the point I want to add is that um, JDR III hooked his son Jay on Asia as well. Yeah. And um, 
sent him over to spend a year uh, in, to, in Japan where he was a university student and so forth. And he, he and I, Jay and I were contemporaries, and I, and, and we hit it off early on. Actually, we all went to the same place in the summer. So I knew Jay, I knew Jay and I knew his sisters, and I didn't, I was just too young to be, JDR was too grand for me, but he was very approachable. My father, and this is in the realm of uh, little known facts, mm -hmm. designed his house in Maine, and the, in which the Buddhas all ended up. And in true JDR third style, it was a very simple farmhouse. So that's my added point. But Jay, Jay was, was when, when I became president of this institution, Jay called me up on the phone. He said, OK, if you're there, I'm going to stay on as trustee. You see, it strikes me as this remarkable innovation as a family. I mean, I looked at um, some of the photographs before. Ronnie, you would have seen them uh, from um, J.D. Rockefeller uh, the thirds visits as a young man to China. Those were photographs, if I'm not wrong, from the late 20s, early 30s. I'm just looking at the uniforms being worn by the soldiers. This is when Shang young Chiang Kai-shek has just come to power um, as head of the KMT, just after the, the Northern March in 27, and you've got him there. But it goes back before then as well, uh, the, uh, the uh, reference to the um, Peking... Um, uh, Union, Medical. Union Medical College in Peking. And so this is quite a remarkable thing for an American family um, who look uh, as um, tr classically and traditionally American as um, anyone from Boise, Idaho, except they weren't, um, yet with this deep passion for Asia. And just to go back to this one thing, I might try and pull it out of you one more time, uh, Bob, is was he conscious of the possibility of being accused of being uh, soft on communism or soft on um, a robust American approach to Asia? Because on the very day that uh, you're having people hauled before the uh, Un-American Activities Activity uh, Committee, he decides to establish this place. Do you have I any sense of risk? I'm cognizant of it, but uh, you know, everybody in America in those days recognized the McCarthy period was coming to an end in 1956. The heyday was in the early 1950s. And I, I think the influence of the name Rockefeller was not going to tempt people in Congress. Uh, and they would have had quite an adversary if they ever tried to run JDR third. So he said he was a tough guy. But I, I would add one other thing to it, and that is that he he established the institution in 1956, but he did not, it was not fully operable until the late 50s, and then Asia House was inaugurated in 1959. So there was a period of time in which they were not as, as public about it. Mm. And I guess the final thing I'd say is that uh, he knew that he was starting with art first, mm. and, and traditional Asian art and performing arts, and that those that emerged in the, in the early uh, 1960s um, were, were an enormous attraction to the Asia Society. It was considered a treasure from the outset, great reviews, but it was nothing controversial. Mm -hmm. And the more controversial issues, I think, were addressed in the late, uh, in the late 1970s. And, uh, so you had another period of hiatus in which things were spectacular mm -hmm. in aesthetic terms, but politically neutral. Backroom, di backroom diplomacy, the opening of channels, uh, art being the medium, uh, and the, uh, the door, if you like, but substantive political dialogue as well. The birth of the Williamsburg um, uh, process, let's call it that way. I throw this open to any of you who could bear some, uh, provide us with some insight as to how that one came about. Let me have a shot at that because um, I kind of know some, I'm sort of the ghost of Asia society past. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, the decision to have 
a uh, program called Williamsburg was made in the late 1960s. And uh, then the first meeting, I think, occurred in 1972. Williamsburg was a, an annual meeting that first happened in Williamsburg, Virginia, and then went to various places around Asia, bringing together uh, several Asian elites in policy terms, in political life, uh, in business, uh, in academic terms, and wonderful people. And it was an off-the-record meeting. And it went on for a period of almost 15 years before it morphed into other programs of the society. But the fascinating thing about it was that it was kind of uh, JDR III's dream of having these people come together, talk about common issues, not having press present, and be able to do that really in a candid fashion. So it was a people-driven idea, and it had just enormous effect in, in, the, uh, in the region. I remember seeing JDR, he was very quiet at Williamsburg meetings for the most part, but he would sit there, speak almost, almost Buddha-like, quietly with a slight smile on his face, taking notes. And if you really wanted to learn to read uh, JDR III, you had to watch his eyes. And they would squint sometimes when he agreed. They'd open wide when he was surprised. But that was about the only movement that one could see. And then <laughs> occasionally, you'd get that little smile. And you'd know that somebody hit the point right on the head. <laughs> the um, Williamsburg, I think, uh, Ronnie, the first time I met you was at a Williamsburg um, meeting in Siam Reap in Cambodia. Um, I think you were there too, my friend. It was indeed. Mm. Your involvement in Williamsburg goes back to um, the early days? Goes back to 1991, 92. So that series, uh, as I have um, uh, heard about it from the outside, actually brought together, in a very novel way for the time, what we would now call, I suppose, a second track dialogue. Second track dialogue is a term not used in 1969. It wasn't a term used in 1979. I'm not even sure about the 80s. Uh, but this is, this is the substance of what it actually unfolded, and the folks around the table were people of substance, meeting in quiet. And they formed lasting relationships with each other. Mm. So your reflections on those, um, those dialogues, my friend. Well, let me backtrack a bit. Nick, what was your first encounter with the Asian Society? Another little-known fact. Um, I was uh, in the mid-80s walking down Park Avenue experiencing a very sharp um, call of nature. <laughs> and I came by this building, and it said Asia Society on it. And I said, well, maybe I can get some comfort in there. <laughs> And, and I did, and given all the things that came later, I have to say it was a very positive story. <laughs> so, it was both a physical and a spiritual experience. <laughs> all the, the mind and the body are joined. <laughs> Definite serendipity. That's, uh, that's a great story. It's the, true. It's yeah. really true. <laughs> we yeah. wouldn't imagine you made that up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just not digging any deeper. I'm just moving on. The, um, but tell me about um, your um, engagement with some of our earlier presidents and, uh, and chairs. I'm told, for example, that um, you would uh, often travel abroad. Uh, tell us about a, a meeting that you had, which I've just been... Uh, briefed on before we came on stage uh, in Seoul, in the Blue House. Uh, I think you were there with um, Hank Greenberg. You're a very mischievous man. Um, <laughs> no, I, yes, I mean, I had, I, I'm glad to have an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about Hank Greenberg, because he was a very, very important uh, chairman. Um, I started with John Whitehead, who I knew from State Department days, and who I thought was one of the great uh, the great men of his time. And Greenberg I knew well from my time as ambassador to the Philippines because he had big interests there and he 
he would always come and 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 need a one-on-one -on -one briefing and so i i knew him as well anyway we were uh putting on a big corporate conference in seoul and i have to say the edge of society invented the big corporate conference and the person who invented it was bob oxnam who put a big show on in in uh, hong kong and then in in bali which got everybody's attention and then everybody started doing corporate conferences and uh, uh, they became dinosaurs who died but in any case but at the World Economic Forum, I have to say, they point to those yeah. and Williamsburg as being the precursor for what we see today in Davos and other exactly, things. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I, 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 I think that's absolutely correct. Anyway, um, Hank Greenberg, whose generosity helped make this, moder this build, modernize this building for the role of the Age of Society to play, um, was a, a very determined person, as you all know. Oh, I've always found him shy and retiring. And um, <laughs> his best friend in the world, after his wife Corinne, uh, was a little dog named Snowball. And Hank really didn't like to go anywhere without Snowball. Um, but the Blue House, the Blue House police had strong views about... Presidential palace in, in Seoul. Well, this is actually in a great big hotel, but the president was going to be speaking there. And right. so these guys were responsible for, for, the, uh, for security and so on and so forth. And they were goddamned if they were going to let a little dog in there uh, <laughs> when the... <laughs> when the president was speaking. I passed this along to Hank and uh, Corinne, and they smiled. And <clears throat> dinner time comes, and in comes Hank, in comes Corinne, and they had a little package, a little suitcase, not suitcase, a little briefcase with little air holes in it <laughs> under, under their... Un, 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 uh, 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 under their arm, and they walked in, and that was there was uh, Snowball. He didn't run around or do anything bad, but he, he they was damned if they were not going to take him with them. So <laughs> this was the determination that built a huge insurance company that helped build the Asia Society. Uh, Hank was a trustee here for 26 years, hmm. in addition to being chairman for seven. So. It's another little-known fact. The, uh, the snowball interaction with the Korean president. Yeah. I'm sure they would have gotten along fine if they had to, but, but the, the, the those policemen, nothing they could do about it. They were presented with a very polite, firm, fait accompli. In uh, inimitable Greenberg style. Mm. Now, Ronnie, China. There's a... Um, We've seen this extraordinary um, footage uh, just now on the, uh, on the movie about the Hong Kong Centre. Many of us have seen it, most of, it uh, most of us take our hat off for the work you've done there. So where did the idea come from? When did you start planning? Uh, I presume it was just smooth sailing all the way. Tell us a little bit, just tell us a little bit about how you turned that idea into what we see today. I'll be brief. Um, I attended the very first meeting of uh, the Asian Society in Hong Kong. Nick, uh, you, no, Bob, you were the one who came with John Whitehead yeah. in 1990, I think. Correct. And before that, uh, you guys came many times, but no response. Nobody was interested until uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. Right. And then um, Willie Purvis, the then chairman of HSBC, um, really responded and gathered a group of people together, um, including um, Sir Q.W. Lee, who became the founding chairman uh, in Hong Kong. In 1994, I was attending one of the uh, annual corporate conference with uh, Nick, and uh, Nick really made no, no mistake really uh, serving as president except once, and that was he invited me to join, uh, to, 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 to chair the Hong Kong Center. 
because Sir QW want to retire. And so, long story short, I, I served, and I, in 1998, uh, we hired a very capable lady, uh, Mary Lee Turner, to be the Hong Kong Center Executive Director. And I told Mary Lee, I said, Mary Lee, you warm the seat for one year, and I'm out of here. Uh, I would have self served five years. Uh, time to go, have new blood in. Uh, and um, the only problem is uh, I invited somebody to be a, who happened to be a troublemaker. Uh, to the advisory council of the Hong Kong Center, and he's sitting in the front row is Jack Wadsworth. <laughs> and uh, Jack came to the meeting one day that I chair and said, uh, I think it's time for us to have a permanent home in Hong Kong. And, um, and everybody said, yeah, yeah, good, great idea. I shut up because I know what it means. It means a lot of work for me. Um, and so that was 1999, I think it was, uh, and we found a place, and then um, I can't leave because um, uh, as the chair, you know, I know Sir Tong, who was very helpful, who was already the chief executive of Hong Kong uh, after 1997. Uh, I have connection with the jockey club and all that stuff. I need to raise some money. Uh, and then Sir Tong gave us the site uh, together with the then Secret uh, chief secretary, Ensign Chan, and financial secretary, Donald uh, Tsang. Uh, and then I need to go to a jockey club to get the money. And so eventually I got the first hundred and two million Hong Kong dollars, which is roughly uh, 13 million US dollars, and that's how we began. Then, you know, I have always run a society in Hong Kong in a very lean and mean way. We never uh, am in the, in the red, always in the black, until the last two years before we opened the Hong Kong Center. It was just, you know, horrific. Uh, we started with, uh, we thought that the budget is gonna be 200, roughly 205 million Hong Kong dollars. It ended up uh, 500 plus, million Hong Kong dollars, uh, and I can't, le I can't leave anymore because how, how do you leave the chairmanship to somebody else and say, you pay, right? <laughs> you, know, you find them. Uh, and so it really um, took us a while to, uh, to, to get our uh, books back together, but once we opened it in 2012, and many of you were there uh, for the opening, I think I must say that Jack, I don't know if you took you by surprise, but it took me by surprise. Jack is a foresighted guy. I was just a, I, I, I'm just a, I, I'm just a back room guy doing all the dirty work, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once we opened the, the Hong Kong Center, I realized, my, we have changed the Hong Kong Center. What I didn't know at the time was we might have even changed the Asian society in some, mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and unlike in New York City where there's a lot of competition, in arts and culture, in, in business and policy. In Hong Kong, there's almost no, no competition. You know, by the way, let me go back to say one thing about the Williamsburg, which I also attended many a times, uh, and then later the annual corporate conference that Bob started and Nick continued. You know, in those days, to talk about Asia is an unusual thing. It's really a society in Asia that first started to gather people together to talk about Asia. And of course, Asia's relationship with the United States and with the rest of the world. Now everybody does that. Hmm. And so we're now on to doing something else. So Asia Society has a track record of always doing uh, avant-garde, always in, 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 ahead of everybody. And same with the Hong Kong Center. Uh, and um, uh, for those of you who have not been to the Hong Kong Center, uh, my sympathy, but you can correct that by just coming uh, on the next flight and give us a call first. Um, we run 200 some programs a year there. Uh, it is really an architectural ge uh, gem, uh, and um, I just love the place. By the way, I don't go to my Hanglong office too often these days, uh, only as necessary, but the rest of the time, I have a little cub cubicle at the corner uh, of Asia Society, and I just love the place. But let me... Can I, can I just ask how many people in the audience have been to the Hong Kong Center? How, how wow! Wow! It's amazing. So those of you who have been there, it's in Admiralty. It's one of the only horizontal structures in Hong Kong, and especially in that location. And I moved there for three months this past spring. And on the first day I was there, a wild boar was on the loose on the property <laughs> in the middle of Hong Kong. And that's how extraordinary the setting is. But this has become an incredible hub. And I, frankly, having been all over Asia for the State Department and the U.S. government. I think it's the best public policy center in Asia that I've seen. It is spectacular. So if you haven't gone, you need to mention the award. 
Oh, we won many, many uh, no. architectural awards. And this year, <laughs> we were picked by AIA, uh, American Institute of Architects. Every year, they pick 11 buildings from around the world as the best, designed by uh, AIA members. And this year, we're, we're one of them. Couple of historical. <laughs> A historical uh, perspective. One from Nick, and then I'll be Bob. Um, I think that the Asia Society Center in Hong Kong was born out of Tiananmen. 89 Tiananmen. People in Hong Kong are very worried. People are worried about Hong Kong's continued existence as an international city. Hong Kong people, as it was explained to me, wanted a vote of confidence from the international community as they thought was best represented by a Rockefeller institution in the, uh, in the U.S. So they took the initiative. I wasn't there at all. They took the initiative. And I think the hard-headed response from Bob Oxnum was, if you can raise the money, you can do it. And they raised the money in three months, as I understood it. But it was, in fact, uh, probably the easiest fundraising I've ever done because once you move into a group of, of respectable tycoons, uh, they all know each other. They all belong to the same club. They go to jockey club and so forth, and boom, <laughs> things can happen overnight. It's a miracle. Then, Try to do that in New York City. It's when it came time to sell the uh, government um, uh, this, uh, on the concept of a, of a permanent home, the same dynamic came into play, and the arguments that we made to C.H. Tung was, now that you're part of China, this was after the 1997, um, I, the, there is some sense that, that uh, the, the Asia Society, that Hong Kong needs another vote of confidence uh, from the international community, and what could be better than having a permanent home for the Asia Society. Bob? Kevin. No, 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 go ahead. Bob? The founding of the Hong Kong Center was easier in terms of fundraising than it was in politics, though, because uh, Tiananmen occurred just as we were beginning to launch the first idea. And the money was there, but there were loads of people who said, look, get out of China, get out of Hong Kong, this is something we must protest. It's a matter of conscience. Of course, it was. And one of the most interesting meetings I had was with John Whitehead. We sat down right after Tiananmen happened. We said, Here in New York? Right here in New York, in his office. Yeah. And said, what are we going to do? We've got, a, we've got an annual dinner coming up next week. And how are we going to deal with it? And he and I talked for about two hours, and we came up with the same answer, and that is, you have to be critical. You have to state yourself uh, as a non-political institution that you're speaking as individuals. And you have to do that at an annual dinner. And then you have to stay engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think out of that, there was respect for the Asia Society uh, taking that kind of stand. And there was also a recognition that we weren't an enemy of the Chinese people. We were saying something about uh, a terrible moment in Chinese history. I, I want to take, uh, just say two other things. Um, one is that once we actually had a center in Hong Kong, before we had the building, there was this tremendous inauguration of, I think it was in 1991, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 1991. And, and, and Bob Scalapino was a speaker, but also it was not the one that Henry Kissinger came to. No. It was the, the launch was. The launch was. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've got to tell you how uh, John Whitehead introduced Henry Kissinger. It was one of the cleverest comments I've ever heard. He said, Henry Kissinger is a remarkable man, but I've got to say he's one of the most modest people I've ever met. You look around the room, most modest people, Henry Kissinger. And he said, for heaven's sakes, just, just today, he said, we were coming into the airport. And he he saw this sign, welcome to HK, and he thought it was about himself. <laughs> 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 
that, that, that actually has the absolute ring of truth about that's it. True. The, that's true. Josette, you were going to I say something. I just wanted to use this moment where we're talking about the centers, because we don't have all the founders of the different centers, just to read the list. And we have many of the chairs here today. So I just wanted, so Asia Society, 1956, Washington, D.C., 1971. And we were cleaning through and digitizing uh, Asia Society's contents over the past couple of years. We found letters from, Jay, from, from your grandfather establishing the Washington office. He felt passionate about that because he wanted to connect the leaders of Asia with the leaders in Washington. So it was very much, he felt, his personal work. So that's 1971. The Houston Center is, is set up in 1979. Uh, Eddie Allen is here. Eddie, where are you? So the chair of the Houston Center, uh, his family, his mother, his... I, I, I've met your mother. I never met your father. But Nancy Allen, extraordinary. And you saw how beautiful that center is there. I had no idea Houston's the most diverse Asian county in America. And it's such a... If, if you haven't visited, please do. Um, Los Angeles in 1981, and Tom McLean and Celeste, you're here, so the chair of our Los Angeles Center. Then Hong Kong, 1990, Australia, 1997, and then San Francisco, 1998. So Jack, I think that was when you returned, and Jack and Susie Wadsworth are here. You can <laughs> identify yourselves. But um, So that is our whole Northern California, and our new co-chair, Ken Wilcox, is here, the former chairman of Silicon Valley Bank. So each of these have an incredible story. But then the Philippines in 1999, and Doris Ho, who's the chair of our Philippine Center, is here. By the way, uh, by the way, Charles, uh, she is a grandniece of uh, the President Magsaysay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, no, no, no. <laughs> And Fernanda Ayala Zobel is here also, who's on the board there, extraordinary board, an extraordinary contact with the next generation in the Philippines. Shanghai, 1999, Philippines in 2006, PC Chatterjee just having their 10th anniversary, Korea in 2008. You mean uh, Mumbai? Mumbai. Mumbai, yes. And uh, Korea in 2008, and then this year, we inaugurated our first center in Europe by an extraordinary group of people who came together and said, we need Asia Society in Europe. So it's in Zurich, Switzerland, and we have the first chair, Adrian Keller, here, whose family, I guess, started DKSH how many years ago? As a major, what did he say? 150. 150 years ago. In Asia as a major trading company in Asia, and it still exists and is going strong today. So I think we should give a round of applause to this global network. <laughs> it's interesting when you start to put the evolution of the place together and uh, to take, uh, I think, Ronnie's point earlier on. It's an institution which, since 56, is been in the business of continually reinventing itself. The whole idea of an Asian society appreciating the arts, cultural and civilizational traditions of uh, that vast hemisphere was new. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen anywhere else in the United States at that stage or anywhere else in the Western world for that matter. Williamsburg, new. Um, dialogue, um, second track before the word second track was ever invented. New uh, Asia Society corporate conferences um, pioneered the idea. New, taking it out of New York into Asia and now into Europe. As we all now confronting the Asian century uh, are required across whichever continent we come from to understand the vastness, the diversity and frankly the antiquity of this um, extraordinary part of the world. So you see this pattern of constant reinvention, uh, which brings us uh, to, uh, to you, Josette. Uh, you're now the president of the Asia Society. You've been digging into um, the archives, uh, looking back at uh, how people have innovated within this institution over 60 years. Your reflections on that, but also a, re a few reflections on uh, what next mm -hmm. and into the future. Uh, surely. Um so for this anniversary, 
I did go up to the archives, which are on that Rockefeller estate in Picantico. If any of you have not gone, these are a treasure, not just for Rockefeller institutions, but they also now keep the archives for many significant foundations, like the Ford Foundation and others. And it's a true service. It's an extraordinary place with incredible curators and researchers that look into this. And we became interested in when did the Rockefeller family get interested in Asia? Um, and the earliest thing that we came up with was uh, in the early 1860s, uh, the original John D. Rockefeller, who was not a very wealthy man at that point, and he grew up a very poor man, but he um, always tithed a significant portion of his income. And he kept a ledger, so we know every penny he ever spent, ledger A, right? And this very famed ledger is there in the archives. You can actually see it. But he uh, donated half his monthly salary to uh, help hungry children in China in, I think it was 1863. That's extraordinary because he grew up in western Pennsylvania and then Ohio, and this wasn't quite the thinking at the time. But um, if you look at the history of his the legacy institutions. So the Rockefeller Foundation has given the second largest contribution it's given over its history was to China outside of the US. And not only did that create institutions throughout the world, but the Peking Medical Union College was really the first medical training school in China. And it had branches all over China. and really an incredible legacy to this day. So it struck me that this appreciation for Asia and in the diaries and the books, whichever ones you pick up, it's never about a misunderstood Asia. It's this deep respect for the history and cultures of Asia. And, um, and so that really strikes me. That DNA was so new. And also, you know, today you see many institutions in the United States and elsewhere saying, oh, we've got to open offices in Asia. Maybe in the 90s that became a big thing. And certainly for public policy institutions, you see a number in the U.S. now saying, you know, we've got to get a foothold here or there. As you see, this institution was doing this decades ago and really doing it when it mattered most. It struck me when um, the vice premier of China, Liu Yangdong, was here a few years ago, two years ago. And she's the only woman in the top 10 circle. And she spoke to a very crowded audience here in New York. And she said, you know, I'm so glad you all want to see me. And she said, I'm remembering back to my first trip to the United States, to New York. And it was about 1982. And she said, nobody would see me. She said, I was vice president of the Communist Youth League. And she said, I couldn't get appointments. And she turned to me and she said, except just at, at the Asia Society. And she said, the Asia Society took me around and introduced me to who I needed to know. And I came to appreciate what this country was all about. It was this guy that was doing it. But that was, it's a remembered story. And to me, Charles, the gift that your family has given not only to this institution, but to this country, is a, a long narrative of respect and appreciation. And we continue to build on that fabric. And so that's something that I think is critical. Um, today, as we look ahead, I think um, I'm struck by the political tone in America today, and I think the fact that institutions like ours become the fabric that we need to fall on. And if you think of the great people that founded this institution, and I just want to recognize Lucina Hoke, and I understand your family's here, your daughter Alex and her husband, your husband and you, pioneers with John D. Rockefeller, you knew him well, Wash Sisip. These were people who remembered what the word was, world was like when it fell apart. And anyone who had lived through World War I or World War II and understood how bad it can get, never take for granted, I find, the fact that open borders, trade, shared prosperity, building a shared future, all these things are very fragile. And it was built by people who knew what it could be like without that. And so to me, the handshake between generations is so critical here. 
and to really be sure we carry that legacy forward and try to protect these connections that have been built that I think are so critical. Uh, I'm going to talk to trustees tomorrow about something I'm calling 40 under 40, that 40% 40 of our audiences be under 40 years old, that we make sure that we build that kind of future here because we have to have that dialogue while we still have great leaders like Wash here and others to really hand on that tradition. And Charles, it's what I feel is our responsibility at the 60th anniversary. So yes, we've rebooted Rockefeller, we've come cool, our website's amazing, we're gonna use technology to connect us, we're gonna have members all over Asia who can join, whether they're in Kazakhstan or wherever, we don't even need a center because they can join onto our digital dialogue, on all those things. But none of that matters if the true intention of understanding isn't there and the true respect isn't being built between countries. So I, I, I feel the Rockefeller vision was so bold and so ahead of its time that it, we can't even improve on that. We looked at, do we need to tweak it? Do we need to, no, uh, it's fine. It's just we need to find a way, I think, to make sure that all passes on. The vision remains, and um, as we go to Q&A, I'm still struck by, <clears throat> again, something in the film, which uh, John D. Rockefeller III uses back in '56, where he speaks, for the, he speaks directly about the need for a two-way street. Now, think about America as the unipolar power uh, in 1956. Sure, there was, the, there was the Cold War with the Soviet Union, but America's strategic power was, frankly, uh, unchallengeable uh, across the world, absent some thermonuclear disaster. Yet, in that context, he speaks about a two-way street. Um, now, if there is any core concept uh, which underpins where we need to be today in dealing with the challenges to our 21st century global order, it's the, it's the concept of a two-way street built on mutual respect and as we often say in this place and from this stage, we're in the business of professional bridge building. When there's a whole bunch of people around the world who want to tear bridges down, we build them up. And that's the only way in which you can begin to take the first step to solve a problem. Now, we've got some time for questions from the audience, folks. So you've got, um, you've got uh, leaders, modern and ancient. Um, <laughs> You have leaders, all experienced and great, uh, who have seen this institution uh, from the get-go, almost, uh, or at least have known people from the get-go. So any questions from the audience? If you could simply um, uh, indicate uh, by um, throwing your hand in the air. There's a gentleman up there. We'll bring a microphone to you. And if I could just mention, we also have the great Hal and Ruth Newman here. And Hal, you also have been someone who's really made sure the next generation knows how important it is to do this work. And I just want to recognize that and thank you for that. Sir, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Dick Drobnik from the University of Southern California. Um, to, to any of you, uh, what do you see as the most important challenge for the Asia Society going forward over the next 10 to 15 years? And how will you approach that challenge? Let me begin. Um, Asia Society has been able to keep bridges and build bridges when the external environment is to tear down bridges. Consider the fact that 1990, Nick begin to, 91, begin to work on Iran behind the scene. And when the deal was signed recently, what, two years, three years ago, if not for the fact that a, a Wall Street Journal you know, blew the cover, so to speak, a, and exposed it, nobody would have known that Asia Society was really behind the scene working. Myanmar being another one, as you saw in the film. And in the next 10 years, uh, I see a lot of possibilities of suspicions across the Pacific. And while all these perhaps difficult situations may arise, I think it, is, it behooves us as the Asia Society to be the sensible voice. We may say, say things that we have to say, but at the same time, we're not here to burn bridges. I think that such an institution 
um, must exist. And I think that we, perhaps more than, or at least as much as anybody else, should and can fill that role. I think it's important to remember that bridges require maintenance. <laughs> and um, a lot of bridges that we have built uh, have, are, are still quite fragile and need to be um, reinforced. And I think Iran is one of them. Um, I think our China relationship needs, continues to need work constantly. Uh, and you can go th down the list of, of relationships that require tending and um, constant um, attention. And this is the challenge for the future, not to necessarily dream up the next big thing, but to keep going and keep um, tending those bridges that you've built already. I just add to that, that I, I agree fully. But I think when one uses a term like pivot to Asia and then doesn't, that you're making a mistake in international relations. And I think the pivot to Asia could come depending on how the vote goes in, uh, uh, on November 8th. But the, um, I think the key issue is having a State Department whose Asia specialization is very high and having institutions like an Asia society and academic institutions that are supportive of knowledge about Asia working in a kind of cohesive fashion um, to try to support your notion of maintaining the bridges. I think you're right. I guess the, the thing that comes to mind for me, I think, is uh, really supporting everything that's been said here. We talk a lot here about Thucydides' trap. We talk about the ancient philosopher who wrote about the competition between Sparta and Athens and observed that when a new power is rising and takes on an old one, this inevitably leads to conflict. Well, Graham Allison at Harvard found in his studies that actually, in some cases, it doesn't lead to conflict and there can be an alternative future. And we really think about where are the gaps? Not how to replicate what other institutions are doing, because many institutions now are doing things that Asia society is doing, but where are the gaps? What needs to be tended to in these bridges that others are missing? And I will say, this is a, we have a very bold board of trustees, our vice chair Lu Luang's here and others, that supports us taking risks when others aren't daring to go over those bridges. And I think that's our unique role. This is an institution that's always taken risks. Our founders set that tone here. And I think, you know, so for me, it's how do we ward against the inevitable, which is the conflict. Uh, John D. Rockefeller, all the Rockefellers love Japan. I just want to mention that. We've talked a lot about China and invested very deeply in it. And after World War II, we're among the first there to build that. And I worry also, as I said, about making sure we're, we all take the responsibility to bring another generation into this fold and start mentoring the new leaders that uh, need to take on this challenge. I think if I was adding a thought from the perspective of the Asian Society Policy Institute about the future would be to take this point that Nick made about maintaining the bridges <clears throat> and building new ones uh, to where the future challenges lie. When this uh, institution began, it was how do you build this bridge across the Pacific to the United States and Asia? If we're serious about bridge building, um, then there are bridges to be built, uh, not just between <clears throat> this country and China, new bridges, more diverse bridges and with new traffic on those bridges, but also bridges between Japan and China, and bridges between the two Koreas. Uh, bridges between China and Southeast Asia. We're aware of what's happening in the South China Sea. Uh, bridges between China and India. Uh, bridges in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab world. Mitch Julis is here and he's um, supported us with dialogues on that very subject here in this building. And bridges between the Iranians and the Arab world. Therein uh, lies a challenge in itself. So it is this new bunch of bridges which need to be built, and then against, I think, the big background, which is uh, that 
what we've seen as sort of the overall stability of what Henry Kissinger and others would describe as the post-war global order, it's really starting to shake a bit, starting to shake a lot. And, and on the big bridges, US-China, US-Russia, um, I wonder where all this is going to take us, uh, unless we have some intelligent architects uh, who are able to do some, some serious thinking, planning and new construction work. Otherwise, we end up in this zero-sum game world. I've just come from Moscow and Beijing in the last week. Three days Beijing, three days Moscow. And you know what stuns me as a person who's been in the international relations business for quite a lot of time? Is when you sit down with Russian leaders and you sit down with Chinese leaders, I am still stunned by the level of mutual non-comprehension going on about key judgments about the core interests and values and perceptions and judgments of the United States or of China or of the Russians. So there is, there is a new imperative uh, for bridge building, an absolute imperative. Otherwise, we get thrown into a reverse direction. Moscow, I was debating this guy called John Mearsheimer. Do you know him? Um, uh, father of what's called hyper-realism. Uh, and uh, his prediction is like Thucydides' trap on speed, uh, which basically says we're all heading in the direction of conflict. And uh, this is a message preached by an American academic to both Chinese and Russian audiences. And I'm there. I'm not even an American. I'm saying, yeah, for God's sake, um, the bottom line is we can make differences. J.D. Rockefeller III made a difference. He was a human being who chose to lead and do things differently. So we have an enormous power to actually build bridges and to cause people to walk across them as well. A question we've got from Twitter before we bring this part of our program to a close is as follows. Can I just mention our global co-chair Henrietta Four and Rick Four have, has arrived and oh, she might answer your question too if we get her a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you with us, Henrietta. The um, question from Twitter, and I'll come back to you, Henrietta. You get, you get to um, sum up, even though you've only been here for five minutes. Um, <laughs> it's tricky, but I've done it before. The um, question from Twitter is pretty interesting. How can you, the Asian Society, play a role in increasing knowledge uh, uh, of Asia in mainstream American media? How can we, the Asian Society, or how can you, the question is coming to us from a Twitter follower, play a role in increasing the knowledge of Asia in mainstream American media today? You know, that's, that's a fascinating question. I have, I have some experience with that in the, in the 1970s. Um, when we founded something called the China Council, mm -hmm. right in between a detente and normalization, we brought together a number of just top flight China scholars around the United States. John Fairbank was mm. head of it. And, uh, Brilliant man. Um, uh, what, and Tom Brokaw from media. And then we had business people all brought together to sit down and design a public education effort that related to China. Mm. And as a result, there was a network that was created around the United States of regional China councils, 15 in number supported by National Endowment for the Humanities. And what was the result? There was a tremendous increase in the amount of uh, knowledge that was uh, pervaded in, in uh, schools around those meetings that we had regionally. And the press nationally was fascinated by the issue of what's going to happen in U.S.-China relations. And as a result, I came away with the notion that it's not as complicated as we might think. It just requires particular sorts of issues and bringing together the right group to create the information flow and then go for it. And lots of people are, in fact, intrigued about having a prestigious institution, New York-based, working nationwide to do that kind of education. It can be done. Yeah. Quickly on this. Uh, we do a lot on this and have taken all of that tradition here. One of the things we do is it's really shocking how few leading journalists in America have been to China, or how, the number that have not been, let me say that. And we conduct the premier 
study trip for top U.S. journalists from the top institutions to go to China and meet with, we had an hour and a half with the foreign minister of China on our last trip. They go and spend time with the policymakers first trip, and they make whatever conclusions they want to make, but we feel they have to have that direct experience. As you know, many of our programs are run by journalists, um, and we do a series of programs with you know, all of the, the Financial Times, bureau chiefs uh, in China or other major <laughs> countries in Asia or the New York Times, and reflect historically on how things have, uh, fl uh, have flowed. But I'm particularly proud of the fellowship programs we do to really bring future leaders here and throughout Asia to learn. I, I think investing in that is absolutely key. Tom Negorsi, of course, spent his career at ABC News. And we also do, just so you know, all of these programs we do, we're turning into amazing podcasts that are available to uh, National Public Radio and other places to educate people on it. So. We take that role very seriously, and I think it was a great question. I will just mention that we also obviously are very engaged in Twitter and elsewhere, and I used to be proud of my 30,000 Twitter members, but Kevin has 1.5 million, uh, <laughs> including in China on social media there. So we have quite a reach uh, into the world of media. And I think we have an award. And that a is a uh, great question. I think the... <clears throat> Uh, time has moved on. We must draw our proceedings to a close. Henrietta, did you want to say anything before we close this part can of the proceeding? Can you come down so we can see you? <laughs> you, are, you are speaking to us from the gods up there. <laughs> and as our global co-chair, we should address her as such. Is the microphone being brought to her? Yeah, she has. Hmm. Just come up to the podium. <laughs> all of you, uh, and it is great to see all of you. And I know that I missed the film, but a 60th anniversary does not come along very often. But I am, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> but I am delighted that we have a 60th anniversary and that we can celebrate it, and that we can celebrate it with our friends. Uh, the past 60 years have been important in history and in bridge building. But the next 60 years, I think, are going to be much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of us, we'll need to double down mm -hmm. and really think about those ties, the trips, the events, the culture, the history, what we really want to impart to each other. And with technology, I think we can do it instantly. So for me, the next 60 years is going to be far more important for all of our futures than the past. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen. Please put your hands together to thank this extraordinary panel. <clears throat> <clears throat>